Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi everyone, we're going to get started in just a minute. We're going to give people another uh, minute or so to join and then we'll get started shortly. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today for our webinar on scaling inclusive access. Um, this is, whoop, sorry, our presentation <laughs> went away really quick. Um, this is getting uh, inclusive access started on campus hosted by Red Shelf. Um, I'm Corey Brown, I'm the Director of Marketing and I will be the moderator for this um, webinar. And uh, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, there is a module in your, um, in your dashboard. Feel free to submit questions. And at the end of the webinar, we will, um, I will be asking our presenters um, the questions that we receive. If we don't get to any of the questions in the webinar, um, don't worry, we'll be following up afterwards with a recording and with answers to any questions that we don't get to. Um, and with that, I'm going to introduce Shannon Godfrey and Sarah Ellerberger, and they are going to kick it off. Perfect. Great. Thank you so much, Corey. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, really, for this webinar and kind of our presentation, um, our goal is to provide you all some insights on getting inclusive access started on your campus. Um, we'll also kind of identify some of the roles that are typically involved in getting it going, as well as throughout the process, and just some of the responsibilities or questions that should be considered for that role. And then really at the end, being able to tie it all together to help um, better understand how a partnership with a partner such as Red Shelf, uh, you know, would eliminate some of the challenges in deploying a really consistent and um, scalable program across all of your courses for your students, regardless of the content that's actually being selected um, with the professors. And um, like Corey mentioned, we will have time for some Q&As and then we can always follow up. We know sometimes some of your questions might be very specific to your program needs or your institutions. So um, don't be alarmed if we don't get to all of them uh, and we're, we're happy to kind of drive more specific conversation with you if that makes sense. So with that, I will go ahead and kind of kick things off. I'm one of your presenters today, Shannon Godfrey. Um, I've been working with Red Shelf for a little over five years now, and since about 2016, I would say, I've been working very closely with many of our campus partners um, to implement and deploy their inclusive access. So happy to be here today, and thanks for joining again. Hi, everybody. Uh, I am Sarah Ellenberger, and I am Red Shelf's Executive Account Manager. I've been here since April and I've been working with all of our regions on inclusive access communication and organization. Um, before that, I was actually in the textbook um, business for a long time as the textbook director at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And then I was at Cornell Store as their academic materials manager. Uh, while I was at Cornell, my job was actually to scale and grow their inclusive access program. 
Perfect. So let's just kick things off. Um, for those of you on the line, we kind of, you know, some of you might be very familiar with Redshelf, currently working with Redshelf, and others might not be as familiar. So just wanted to give you a little bit of background um, of who we are before we really dive into the meat of the presentation. So again, for those of you who are unfamiliar with our company, Redshelf Red streamlines the discovery and distribution of eBooks, e-textbooks, OER, and really any digital content. This includes access codes and homework solutions from our publisher partners. And we do that by working directly with publishers, institutions, as well as some of the independent bookstores, as well as the campus systems that you all have already integrated through your campus. Redshelf provides accessible and affordable course materials to students through our product suite, enhancing teaching and learning while accelerating the learning community's transition to digital. So specifically within our product suite, Redshelf ha has our Redshelf bookstore, that's really our distribution channel for more of a student choice model of students needing to purchase the material on their own. This is our integration model um, through our independent bookstore channel uh, to distribute digital content, as well as our um, LMS e or as well as our e-commerce solution um, for transactions. Then we have a newer tool that's recently come out into the market, Redshelf Adopt. This is a faculty facing solution to help manage and collect adoptions. This could reside um, adoptions that are inside of the inclusive access program, as well as outside the inclusive access program for the entire campus. Then we have Redshelf Inclusive. This is really what we'll hone in on the most today. Um, this is our end to end content delivery solution that really allows us to deliver content on day one to 100% um, of the class while also providing um, extra tools available for administration to manage and run their inclusive access program. And then lastly, our e-reader solution. It's our web browser e-book solution that houses all of our digital textbooks um, and standalone materials for students to be able to interact with and have a, a really seamless and consistent interaction regardless of who created the um, book content. So within the state of Ohio specifically, um, we've worked with more than 15 campuses today with some sort of digital distribution. Um, but these schools located here are um, five of the campuses that we're really helping to establish an inclusive access program today or have been uh, working with them on growing and expanding their programs. So for any of you in the audience, if I know oftentimes looking for references, um, is something that you need from other campuses. While we have 175 plus campuses throughout the nation utilizing our, our program, these are some that are within your guys' state, um, but we're always happy to kind of link people together um, to get other feedback and tips and tricks to help establishing your own program, or even working through some challenges that you might not understand how to um, answer. We might have other school partners that could be a very valuable um, asset for that. Okay, so now let's really get into it. Um, how to get started with inclusive access. Again, we know some of you on the line might already have this on here, so it could be a little bit of a repeat, but we're hoping to enlighten some of um, uh, the aspects that need to be considered um, for the program. Uh, so one of the first steps in starting an inclusive access program is going to be to, de de to determine who your coordinator is gonna be. This person will be your main point of contact for everything around inclusive access. So they will oversee the adoption process, including all communication with sales reps from the publishers and instructors. Um, they'll set up and vet pricing with the publishers, making sure that the pricing is competitive for vendors who don't have statewide pricing. Um, they'll coordinate communication between the bookstore, IT, LMS administrators, and faculty and they'll field questions from customers and instructors. This role is usually taken on by the course materials manager or the store director, but at some campuses, it could be someone else on campus, such as someone in academic affairs or library services. 
Perfect. So after establishing that kind of point person, some of the aspects around campus um, is going to be really determining the billing method for your campus. Um, and this might already be determined based on campus policies, um, based on maybe how you're currently attaching fees to courses, such as a, as a lab manual fee. Some of those might already be in the works where the inclusive access follows that same methodology. But ideally, you know, there's two main methods that we see within inclusive access. The course fee model, where students are billed at the time of registration. Um, this ideally would need advance notice of which courses are going to be into the inclusive access program, but it does allow students to easily identify which of their courses or sections are within the program and to anticipate that charge at the time that their entire bill comes to them. It also provides um, some deadlines for your publishers and faculty on being able to select their courses for the program in advance and to make sure everything is prepared. The one thing to consider if this is the model that you're selecting is really establishing a workflow on being able to process the refunds for those students who have opted out of the program. Redshelf, um, you know, does have these capabilities of supporting it, um, the opt-outs as well as drops through our dashboard and our exports on these statuses, um, but having that be part of the process is something to consider with this model. The second model would be more of an add drop date model. This is where students ideally are going to get two weeks or whatever the campus um, policy is around the add drop period. Students are getting a free trial in order to explore the digital option prior to being charged. So this is um, a really great marketing opportunity for the students to really understand that it's an affordable option, as well as giving them that access to kind of interact and see if this is a right fit for them. And depending on the timing of financial aid dis disbursements for your campus, this could be a great option. If you do set up this sort of model, we do um, suggest establishing some sort of deadlines for faculty to submit the request specifically for inclusive, but know that there is a little more, <clears throat> a little more flexibility on publishers and professors being able to get into the program. And so if your campus has a lot of adjunct professors or um, delays on assigning uh, professors to a specific course, um, this model might allow more courses to become into the program for that given term versus having to hold off um, for an additional term to be involved in. Um, the one thing to know on this is really establishing the proper communication plan for students knowing that they would expect their charge after um, the add drop date or the established date for billing and then also having that workflow with the billing team to make sure that the billing can hit um, immediately after the census date or add drop date that's established. So coordinating with the LMS administrators, this is another important aspect of getting the program started. While inclusive access can most certainly operate outside of the learning management system, we highly encourage that it is involved. Um, and this is specifically to deliver the content to the students. This allows students to easily find and locate their course materials. It provides them a single sign-on directly into the platform for their content access, as well as being able to facilitate their opt-in or opt-out of the program, all from the learning management system. Um, this also allows uh, vendor partners such as Redshelf to be able to easily um, collect the roster and ensure that students that are enrolled in the course are the only ones that are having access to the content, and those who drop within a certain time period would be removed um, from the content as well as the billing to ensure that only active students um, are the ones being enrolled. Great. Um, one other thing that really helps in growing and scaling an inclusive access program is branding it. Uh, so these are some examples of schools who have actually branded their inclusive access programs with the name and the logo. So here we have Cornell, University of Alabama, UC Davis, and San Diego State University. Branding uh, really allows the store and the school to communicate effectively about their specific inclusive access program. It allows them to gain brand recognition among instructors, students, and their administration. 
and it allows them to market their program in many forms. Perfect. And I have to apologize for some of the uh, technical difficulties of the PowerPoint shutting off. I'll continue to try and keep loading it, um, but I do want to apologize um, if it is cutting in and out of your screen. Okay, so to continue on, let's now get into the actual roles of um, and some of the challenges that might be faced within these roles for inclusive access. So first, uh, as we mentioned before, the inclusive access coordinator is going to be the point of contact for everything around inclusive access. They will be responsible for working with the publishers to identify and target inclusive adoptions and to negotiate competitive pricing. They're going to maintain the master list of inclusive access adoptions and they're going to ensure that accurate information is passed along to all the other parties, including displaying accurate information to the students. Uh, and then they will be the main contact for any questions or problems that arise among the students or the instructors. Perfect. And so we did kind of cover on the different billing methodologies um, that a campus could deploy, but really within the bursar or the registrar team, this is um, a really important role on identifying the proper payment workflows and uh, ways that, you know, being able to integrate through campus systems, um, as well as any campus policies around billing and enrollments that need to be taken in consideration. Some of the questions that we often, um, you know, ask when we're sitting in a round table with all these kind of roles coming together at the very beginning, beginning and determining how to get this sort of model rolled out on campus. Um, some of those questions that we ask specific to this team is really who is determining that pricing structure for the student charges? And if it is that course fee model, how are refunds going to be processed? Is it automatic for those that drop within a certain time period? But what about those that opted out? And what does that workflow look like? Um, what are some of the informations that the bursar team and register team might need um, for processing the billing correctly? Um, obviously, the price of the content is a really important, um, but understanding all the items that they might need, as well as any sort of deadlines in order to post or um, have the courses be considered for inclusive access might be under control with the, this team as well based on the billing. We would also want to understand, you know, from our perspective, is there opportunity to integrate within your student information systems um, to be able to help post charges to the accounts or really to provide some sort of format that can be uploaded to an FTP site, um, you know, that would include charges or refunds that would fit the format of what your teams needed to help automate that delivery of posting charges or refunds. So the LMS team um, or IT team, again, another important aspect um, of getting started with inclusive access. Um, this team already works very closely with um, faculty on helping them get their courses set up. Um, so many things already reside within the learning management system. So having inclusive access, a part of that makes perfect sense as well. And I think that there is a critical role here on really establishing a proper workflow to making it as simple as possible on the faculty as well as this team here. Some of those questions that might need to be considered is, you know, really understanding if there's an approval process for new vendor integrations in the learning management system, um, if there's security vetting or installation timelines. Um, that need to be considered. This could also play a factor in which courses or publishers might be able to go live in a, uh, in a recent term versus a future term. Understanding um, really what those timelines are and what the approval process is. So as soon as a, a publisher partner or a third party vendor has been identified, that process can um, get into motions right away. Who will assist in establishing the overall workflow for courses setting up in the inclusive access program? And are the professors going to be responsible for setting up their content or the LTI, which allows the single sign-on? 
if the professors are responsible for setting up the content within their course each term, then how do we make sure that we have the proper instructions for them and the proper, um, you know, kind of workflows so they can get everything set up in a timely manner. We also want to understand if the IT team has any sort of help desk. Um, you know, for Redshelf, we have a strong training and customer experience team. So really making sure that we can help um, train help desk um, personnel, have um, other knowledge base information that we can include in pre-existing infrastructures that you have within your help desk, and also having a handoff workflow so that we can really assist any students or faculty when it comes to their inclusive access course. And then lastly is the um, faculty training groups or anyone to help coach faculty on new programs. Is that within the IT and LMS team? And if so, um, you know, establishing that sort of workflow, like Sarah mentioned, also putting the branding of this program um, within this area as well, really helps to help promote and market this program um, through a different avenue as well. Another one of the very important roles on campus, obviously, for an inclusive access program is going to be your instructors. So the instructors on your campus are going to need to know how the program works and exactly what they need to do to be a part of it. The inclusive access coordinator will need to maintain communication with all of the instructors participating in the program. They're going to need to let the instructors know how to submit inclusive access adoptions and where they can learn more about the program. The coordinator will need to be sure to communicate accurate pricing information to the instructors. And they'll need to explain to the instructors how to communicate the value of the program to their students, including uh, syllabus language and maybe wording or instructions to use within the learning management system. Effective communication with the instructors on your campus will help to ensure consistency in your program and help reduce questions and issues. So lastly, the students, the ones that are, you know, participating in this program. Um, I think most of the roles that we've uh, discussed and those challenges is definitely around getting a program started and then items that need to be considered you know term over term to really have a great workflow of being able to deploy the courses live but then for our students how are they going to know about the program so having places like an faq page or a website that they can learn more about the program the syllabus language um, the lms instructions like sarah had mentioned that the instruction the instructors could provide to these students all of that really plays a critical role for them to understand this um, especially getting started if a student is only enrolled in one inclusive access course at the very beginning it's a change in workflow on how they're receiving their um, course materials so making sure that they very much understand how the process works the affordability aspect of the negotiated price that the campus um, was able to achieve as well as being able to inform them around important deadlines such as the opting in and out um, deadline for the program. Um, as the program does scale and it becomes more routine for students, it'll become much easier for them um, because this is what they'll start to get used to for their courses. But at the very beginning, because of that change, you know, communication and passing that down to the students in multiple different ways is really important. We've even seen footnotes on the course catalog um, as another aspect to kind of identify um, which courses are in the program to, to hopefully help students understand what they're enrolled into. So now I'm going to transition, you know, really over into uh, uh, Redshelf's platform and kind of going through the motions of getting this started um, on a campus. Like I mentioned before, the, the benefit of Redshelf is that, you know, there is aspects that can um, be plugged into a campus um, based on what you already have established and utilized as a great program and, and attach into that um, to just making this come to life a little more simple for those on the end, um, as well as making it scalable and very consistent. And so one of, I wanted to start off with this quote. Um, I was recently at the D2L Fusion Conference last week, actually, and John Baker, the president and CEO of D2L, brought up this quote by Marshall McLuhan. And I just thought, 
as he was speaking about D2L's kind of uh, you know methodology and what they're doing for their technology, all I could think about was this presentation and how this quote very much sums up, I think, getting inclusive access started on a campus. And you know, understanding how new technology partners um, such as Redshelf can really help ease the anxiety um, and some of the pain points and challenges that a campus might um, come through. So that's really what I'm gonna try and do is tie it all together um, from our tech, being a technology partner with an institution and really hoping that you can see how it can ease the anxiety of a school getting their program off the ground. So the first bit of that is really that end-to-end -end solution. Our enterprise level platform really scales to meet your campus needs. Um, these items are just some of the items that are included in being able to assist a campus with their program. So not only does it can, um, create really consistency for our students, that's one important aspect that we wanna make sure no matter the course or the content that's selected, the platform that the students are using to opt in and out, um, to access their content, it's very consistent for them. But then we also wanna ensure that there is really one platform that can help manage this for an entire campus. Um, like I mentioned, it is customizable to kind of leverage our technology through pre-existing um, campus systems um, to have an even better integration and automation of the program. So one thing that I really wanted to touch on first was accessibility. Um, I think when new technology vendors are coming onto any campus, we know that accessibility is one of the main um, needs and one of the vetting process of getting started. Inclusive access is really no different for this. And so as a partner of the campus, we want to ensure that those accessibility needs are met. Um, we have a team of experts um, helping to streamline standards and students' experiences across the entire education spectrum. And really for Redshelf, accessibility is not a feature. It is a requirement. And it's our commitment for us to ensure that accessibility is a thought at the very beginning of any of our product development or de design. It's woven into every aspect, every ticket, all of our team members are trained and we're constantly making sure that we're at the forefront of what's needed for reaching accessibility needs. This map really highlights what we've done really in the last six months or so of being able to attend campus discussions and demos around accessibility, our conferences, meetings that we're having with publishers, school visits around um, accessibilities, conferences that we're planning to attend, and then even partnering with various accessibility um, uh, organizations to come together and really define and help push through some of the gray area that um, is within accessibility standards. We want to make sure that when a campus deploys this platform from all aspects, behind the scenes to forward facing to the students, every um, everyone can access it in the same means without having to go to a different platform or through a different channel. So it all resides in one platform for Redshelf and that's a really important um, aspect for our entire um, kind of universal design of our program and our platforms. So managing the adoption process, um, as Sarah mentioned, you know, um, and we kind of highlighted some of the schools we're working with, Redshelf um, has a very strong relationship in the independent bookstore community. And so for many of the campuses that do have a campus ran or independent bookstore, you know, many times they are the key drivers towards these inclusive access programs because they're already doing pretty much um, everything around this program they do daily for the textbooks. And so if an adoption um, tool is already being utilized by your campus, that's something that we can um, receive the adoptions from to keep moving through on the program. But for those campuses that, that don't have a way of collecting those adoptions, that's one area of being able to help manage that adoption process. So whether it's through Redshelf Adopt, um, being able to collect any sort of adoptions, as well as our inclusive access course management dashboards. So that really allows us to work with the campus on identifying the courses that have been confirmed 
into inclusive access and then making sure that the publishers are organized with the proper pricing that either Ohio Links has set up, um, but also for publishers that aren't part of Ohio Links at this point. That's one aspect for Redshelf. Um, as you know, we mentioned at the very beginning, not only do we work with many publishers across the spectrum, but specifically for inclusive access, we're seeing over 150 different publishers um, wanting to get involved in inclusive access and support this sort of program. So ensuring that you do have the best pricing available and that's managed through a portal to make it very easy for the Bursar team um, to build communications, um, all of that can reside in one interface. So um, as we mentioned, communication is very key around these programs. So after we collected the adoptions, we know what's going into inclusive, that funnels and goes live within the learning management system and presents the um, IA coordinator a dashboard that allows them to customize and scale communication across courses and students. They can filter um, various student types like let's email only students that have opted out at this point to remind them that they still have an opportunity to opt into the program by a given deadline. So being able to have that customization makes it really easy to facilitate a variety of different um, communications to the students. And because of our integration through the learning management system, the rosters are updated daily. So it reflects proper enrollment of making sure all students that are enrolled are accounted for and any student that dropped is removed and like I mentioned as well as counting their op status. So in this same interface we also are managing the opt-outs. So we have seen a number of campuses that have gotten started with this program where they've created some sort of form um, or email system for students to inform the campus that they wanted to opt out. And at a very small level, when it's a couple courses um, and a handful of students, it's, it's very simple to manage. But over time, as this starts to scale, you know, making sure that it is continued to be managed um, properly is something that we saw a need for this industry. And so creating a way to not only capture the opt-outs in an automatic fashion for the students, but then displaying that for the administrators became really important. So we are not only able to provide you in real time if students are opted in or out of any given course, but we also can aggregate that percentage so you can easily look and say, you know, do we have any at-risk courses that have a high opt-out rate? And why is it such a high opt-out rate? Is it something like lack of communication to the students um, or was it just the wrong course for the program? So not only can we aggregate that for you to try and identify before it's too late, but we also can drill down to the exact reasons of why students are opting out to help understand if it is something that we can troubleshoot at the very beginning of the add drop period to maybe clear up some of that confusion. Or maybe, like I said, it's just a course that does not make sense for inclusive and um, may be removed for the following term. So for us, um, wanted to show some of the national opt-out rates. And you can see getting started really for the bulk of our campuses um, in 2016, I think that's when we started seeing a drive towards inclusive access. We had about an 8.9% um, opt-out rate. But since then, you can see here that it's only being driven down. And I think this has to go with actually scaling more courses on a given campus because it becomes more routine and um, it's more of an awareness of students of what they're doing as well as faculty. And then really um, our goal of helping to build those communication plans and really ensure that the communication is on par for students, we've seen that that's what led to a lot of opt-out rates is just lack of understanding of what the course was and how everything operated. So increasing that communication has also um, driven down the opt-out percentages across all of our partners that we've seen thus far. So leveraging an innovative e-reader. Um, we know that a lot of courses typically get started with inclusive access for the um, homework solutions or adaptive learning coursewares uh, products that publishers have, but not all of those cover every single course or discipline. Many faculty are still utilizing standalone textbooks only, 
And for many of those textbooks, they do have a higher price um, for students to purchase. So when faculty are adamant about wanting to utilize technology in the classroom, they want to go digital, or they really are concerned around um, having the best pricing for their students, inclusive access is a really great program for their textbook to come into um, a digital format. So making sure that um, the platform that's being used is providing students the best experience possible and all the study tools that they really need. Um, we really want to embrace digital and make sure that across the board, no matter who created the content, it could be trade publishers, academic publishers, university presses, faculty created materials or course packets, OER, uh, materials it doesn't matter for any type of content making sure that students have a consistent e-reading experience is really what's important um, when having an e-reader being selected for the campus and this video example here um, I'll kind of talk through it is, is just an example of our interface it's a simplistic design to not overwhelm students that are getting into digital for the first time but as you can see it's giving them the ability to highlight, add notes, which are very common features for most e-readers, but Redshelf is taking it a step further. So a flashcard directly in the content. So giving students that one intuitive platform, um, regardless of the device they're on, this also helps to achieve more focus on the content and less focus on learning the platform. Having these tools reside in one interface also improves the outcomes for students because um, there's some efficiencies that they can have of searching keywords, finding their notes compared to what they highlighted in the book, and always being able to jump back between their study notes and the actual content itself, um, you know, kind of eliminate some of that burden of having to flip through the pages, going to the index. So not only are we trying to mimic what students are used to doing in print, but also have um, improvements around digital efficiencies to improving their digital learning. So lastly, on the kind of e-reading analytics, uh, or the e-reading side is also the analytics. So we know with some of the courseware and homework solutions, there are analytics that are pa being passed back um, to the faculty. But for digital textbooks, this also comes to life in inclusive access. And I think this is really exciting because in the print world and outside of inclusive, it's really hard to aggregate results of one course to understand um, how students are consuming the textbook. So inclusive access is really um, the first way for us to identify those um, analytics and report that back to both faculty and um, campus administrators. And this allows us to help identify at-risk students before it's too late. Maybe they haven't opened up the book and that is a factor of them not doing well in the class. And it can also improve teaching and learning outcomes, um, improvements to the curriculum, how students are really consuming the materials down to the actual page number of where their annotations are taking place the most or not taking place at all. So just to give a quick um, kind of case study that we had from one of our partners, University of New Mexico, um, they deployed inclusive access. They've been doing it for a couple years now. And this was just something that their faculty that participated um, pulled together some results, which is why um, you'll see the range. This was disciplines in mathematics, business, English, um, sciences, so a variety of different disciplines where faculty compared grades and their um, drops and withdrawals from, from their course before it was an inclusive compared to when it was an inclusive access. And you can see passing grades were increasing, the A's were increasing, the withdrawals um, after the ad drop deadline actually decreased significantly by delivering that content. That's a huge factor because we know very frequently students will forego purchasing their books, hoping um, that they'll be okay in class. And by the ad drop, if they're not doing well, they withdraw. So having that first day delivery has been a very great impact on student success for these courses. And then most importantly, that affordability um, bit. Our partners with the bookstore have seen a savings of around 1.1 million, and that was just from one semester of their inclusive access. So this has a massive impact um, financially and for student success for a campus. 
So just wrapping up a, a few other things and then we'll jump into our Q and A's. Um, one other aspect that we pride ourselves on as a partner with our campuses, but we think is very important for any campus to really evaluate is the support and training. So you have everything figured out, all the workflows, but what if students were actually needing help and they were having issues opting in and out or they didn't know how to redeem their access code? With Redshell, everything we develop, everything that we do is in-house and that's by design and that's no different for our customer experience team and our account managers. So we have dedicated support staff um, that is trained in inclusive access to provide your staff, your students, the best possible support as well as training. You can see by some of these silly fun facts that they're real people. And that's really what we want to make sure that when a student does, they're freaking out, they really need something, that they have a human that they can interact with immediately and someone that's relatable for them to help ease their anxiety and continue letting them focus on their class and not so much on how do I highlight or whatever the circumstance might be. So we very much hold their hands through the process as well as provide various tools, uh, video tutorials, trainings um, that helps the campus really get onboarded. And I would say if you're vetting partners, give it a try. Um, message each of the help desks, see the response times, the interactions, that's what your students are gonna be getting and a really important factor that should be considered in the evaluation of a partner. So lastly, I just wanted to kind of tie this all together um, from a, a perspective of the students. And so this is a great example in Canvas. Now I know not all of you on the line are probably a Canvas school. Um, it works very similarly to any learning management system. We have partnerships with all learning management systems, so ideally it would work the same, but wanted to kind of just tie it together on what it looks like for the student. So in each of the learning management systems, we integrate through an LTI tool, which allows single sign-on. So students would be able to um, look into a given term, all of the various courses that they're a part of, and once they click into the actual course that they want, they would be able to see everything that the professor set up, syllabus, their grades, their discussion boards, uh, whatever part of the course that's involved. And now the course material can also take place in the same interface. So you can see here that when students click, they automatically single sign into the Red Shelf interface. They can see every course that they're a part of within inclusive access. They get detailed notes around their opt out. All of this is in one interface for the student. When they select view course materials, it will help them drill down the exact course materials for that given course, eliminating confusion which book is for which course. The opt out experience is also on a course by course level, so students can opt out of one course but remain active in another. So by viewing the course materials, you can see here that I can gain access into my homework solution. And like I mentioned, for the ebooks, they also have access immediately into Start Reading for the um, ebook technology right into our e-reader. The opt-out experience also resides in the same interface, and that eliminates struggles of students needing to click various different links from outside the LMS in order to figure out how to opt in or out of the program around their access. So opting out of the program, students actually have to inform us they want to opt out, we communicate the deadline for them so they're aware. And then we also provide these reasons to help aggregate for the administrator so that we can identify why maybe students are opting out and prevent that in the future or help communicate to them um, right away uh, to help change their mind or explain the program better if they're just unfamiliar. Um, so I'm just gonna select a random answer and opt out. Immediately from me being able to opt out, you can see that my access is actually revoked. So everything is automatic. And then I have the ability to easily opt back in. So if I opted out on day one, realized that it was the best price in the market and this content was actually being used in the class, I can easily opt back in automatically. Now Redshelf can obviously distribute the digital content through our e-reader. We also can work with the publishers, uh, your mainstream publishers, like you see Pearson MyLab here, McGraw Connect, um, SunGage MindTap, Macmillan uh, Launchpad, Sun, uh, Wiley Plus. We work with them all. We can distribute unique access codes to students and making sure that the communication with the publishers of who is enrolled 
enrolled in the course who has opted out, so their access is revoked um, in a timely manner, is something else that we do as a vendor partner through our system. This example here is Pearson and Redshelf have come together to create um, an integration. They're one of our um, first integrations to do this where you know, immediately we're acting as kind of a middleware of students being able to single sign on directly into their MyLab from one interface. So if the students were to opt out of the program, that immediately gets communicated to Pearson um, for that student's access, making sure that billing and census data is automatically aligned for the campus. So I hope this gives you some really good insight around Redshelf and how we're um, you know, able to facilitate a total end-to-end -end solution for a campus to getting the program off the ground. And really, we hope we provide you some kind of ideas to think about of how to really establish a great um, workflow for your inclusive access program. So with that, I think we'll go ahead and um, answer any questions that might have come up. Yeah. Um, Oops, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have two questions that we can address before we end the webinar. Um, the first question we received was around the presentation itself, asking um, if we can send out a copy of the webinar afterwards as well as a recording. Uh, the answer to that is yes. We will be following up with um, a uh, physical um, copy of the webinar along with the recording. So um, be on the lookout for a follow-up email with those two attachments. And then the second question we received um, that I want to address, uh, Shannon, I think is for you. Um, if a campus wants to pilot an inclusive access program, how long would it take to get started? Yeah, that's a um, really fantastic question. So I would say, you know, generally, um, if you're partnering with Redshelf, we can get started right away. It's a, we've automated um, our software to make it very plug and play. We utilize um, standards um, within the industry like our LMS integration. So it's very familiar for the IT or LMS team to get started. We have the established relationships with um, Ohio Link's team on pricing as well as each of the publishers. So I think, um, you know, it could really move as quickly as the campus is able to move. So if billing was identified, um, the green light is to go live. If all of those have been um, ready to go from a campus perspective, we literally can go live this week, no problem for students to gain access. So it is a really quick turnaround time. Obviously, uh, the longer time we have up into the start date of a term, the better communication and training that we could provide. But we have really seen um, uh, campuses and faculty very adamant of wanting to go live last minute because they were assigned to the class and they wanted to match their other um, sections and we could deploy it um, within a matter of hours. So it does make it where it is really turnkey for that campus. Um, awesome. Thanks, Shannon. And then um, another question we received, um, could we talk a little bit more about um, how we work with bookstores that are not independent, um, like Barnes & Noble or Follett or things like that? Yeah, that um, that's a great question. So in um, most instances, we've seen that for campuses that do have a leased um, Barnes & Noble or a Follett store, that those campuses, you know, it really depends on the co contracts that they've established and have in place at the institution. So um, for some of it, it's a matter of working together with those third parties um, where Redshelf is still facilitating the access and distribution of the content to the students. But we tie in with um, Barnes & Noble or Follett to receive the information around the adoption process, the pricing, some of the items that they're already facilitating and in charge of for the campus. We would work with them as if they are almost the I a coordinator in this role. Um, that would, that's how we would kind of work with them, but we would still be the in-facing um, kind of distribution of the content to integrate through the learning management for the system. And then we would always, you know, we could facilitate the um, opt-in and out statuses to um, the bookstores or to a main uh, person on campus, kind of depending on how their workflows are. So really um, it's possible and it's just a matter of, you know, their role in this program and making sure that if, if their role is the IA coordinator that we're just um, communicating with them throughout the process versus um, a different IA coordinator that might be a personnel from the actual campus. Great, thanks Shannon. Uh, we have another question that is about uh, the length of time for which ebooks are actually accessible to the students. 
could you explain um, could you explain a little bit to everybody the difference between a lifetime subscription a purchase and uh, an ebook rental that's only available for a period of time and what those options mean to students yeah most certainly that's a really great question um, and I would say that um, so the great news is that the duration that is selected for any given course can be customized per each course. So within inclusive access, we know that that um, affordability is most certainly the gateway to the program. And in a lot of instances, um, for most courses that we see, especially in general ed, um, you know, the, the book is really only used for that particular course. And if majority of the program operates that way, or the course is only, you know, the, the book is only really significant for the student for that given period, then we usually suggest a limited duration, maybe 180 days that would fulfill an entire semester. From a publisher's point of view, the less time in the book from a shorter duration, the greater the savings or discount that might be achieved. And so really what we do is coordinate of really understanding how the faculty is using the book. So if it is a book, like I mentioned, that only is going to be used for one term, we would encourage a 180 day option. Um, however, if this is a book that is maybe used in several different courses, it's a continuation course that uses it back to back terms, or it's a book that is used, we often see like in nursing and medical programs where those are needed throughout their entire four years, plus um, as a reserve as the student is completing their board exam. So in those instances, having a lifetime, maybe a five year duration might be more relevant. So um, for a campus, you know, it's up to you to either establish kind of a consistent duration that's being used unless otherwise asked, or it can really be course by course, publisher by publisher on, on how that course is being utilized. And our system could kind of accommodate either or. So if it is a limited duration, after that access length, the student's materials would re be removed off of their shelf. If it's a longer term access link or lifetime, then it remains on their shelf and students can always access their content outside of the LMS. So if it is lifetime um, and they're no longer a student, but they're using it as a reference in their career field, they can always just log in direct and still access their notes and the content um, from their shelf. Great, thanks Shannon. Um, I think that about wraps it up. Um, if anyone has any additional questions, um, you can see Shannon and Sarah's contact information here. Feel free to reach out. Um, otherwise, like I said, we will be following up with a recording and a copy of this webinar. Thank you so much to everyone for joining us.